Welcome. My name is John Murphy, and I chair the Citrus County Chamber of Government Affairs Committee, and we are talking with the school board candidates for or uh, that you'll see on the ballot. And we have with us uh, today, Joe Faraday, who is the school board candidate for school board district five. And uh, we've got a series of questions, Joe, that we're gonna run through here. And uh, um, that we think that will be really helpful to our, not only our constituents within the business community, but those folks in uh, in all of Citrus County. So, so let's just dive right in there, Joe. And uh, um, Joe, Let's start with just um, kind of taking a minute or two to, to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your candidacy. Well, I'm Joe Faraday. I've been in Citrus County for 32 years. And during those 32 years, I've been working with children, started with at-risk children in a residential commitment program for adjudicated delinquents. From there, went to do some family counseling, teaching anger management groups, divorce adjustment, parenting classes, and then from there, I went to Department of Juvenile Justice and to the Sheriff's Office as a school resource officer for the last 23 years. I have a master's degree in business and organizational security management and an undergrad degree in behavioral science. Went through the Law Enforcement Academy in 98. So I've been a deputy ever since then and enjoyed every minute of it. But my goal was to work in an alternative school, the Renaissance Center, which I did for many, many years as a school resource officer. I'm married, I have a son that's going to be 31 and a three-year-old grandchild. So that, that basically sums it up. Just recently was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Florida Association of School Resource Officer for my dedication and leadership with children. Um, and 2020 was awarded the uh, Phil Royal Legacy Award for First Responder. So m many of my awards and accolades, uh, you know, I've, I've earned hard work, but more or less, they're all related to children. Uh, about 20 years ago, I started a program called Shop of the Cop in Citrus County. So I'm always looking for innovative ways, volunteering with the Key Center Boys and Girls Club, the Rotary, Kiwanis. I'm out there with you guys with the Stone Crab Jams and different things that we do and different events, Manatee Festivals, you'll see me volunteer at. So whatever it takes, you know, over the last 15, 16 years, my wife and I have been volunteering for many events to make this county what it is. Okay. Very good. So, Joe, let's get right into it. Uh, the first question here, it's got a couple parts to it. So I'm going to kind of get to you in sections, but it's all uh, kind of all interconnected. And that is, um, talk to us about what your thoughts are on vocational at, uh, education versus academic education? And how does that align with our community's needs and the future job opportunities you see for students? Uh, I've worked both. I taught for Rasmussen College for approximately 10 years. Um, in fact, I, I wrote a class uh, called uh, Contemporary Issues in Criminal Justice that they're using at, at Rasmussen College as a subject matter expert. I wrote that course. But I've also worked as a school resource officer at WTC and spent a lot of time in our vocational classrooms. And I really wish we had that shop class back in our high schools. Um, some of my fondest memories uh, in school was definitely in shop class and, and learning the vocational end. Uh, my, my son is a businessman in this county and uh, he started a business. And I wish I would have had him in the vocational school instead of sending him to uh, a college. He, he would have definitely got more out of the vocational. So I'm a firm believer that we need vocational education. We need the plumbers. We need the electricians. We need our HVAC guys, you know, our, our cosmetology. I went through WTC for, uh, it was WTI back then for criminal justice back when I went through the police academy. So vocational education is, is a top priority of mine. So and how do you see that uh, both the vocational education as well as academic education, how do you see that, uh, what are your plans in the next five years in those areas? Well, definitely to assist. Um, I know that WTC is working closely with uh, Wright Rudder and getting some professionals here to help with uh, airplane mechanics and things along that line. And, and I'm really excited that I was there at the beginning when, when WTC was talking about that. Uh, they also have new courses uh, for advanced technologies and things like that, some automated type of uh, workshops. So it, it really is, is exciting. And, and being that my family owns a restaurant, you know, the culinary arts program there, 
So uh, we've hired people out of the culinary arts program and sent them over there to work for, for my family's restaurant. So I, I am a firm believer that it, um, our vocational school needs to grow and um, continue support of it. I'd, I'd like to see more of the, in the medical field expand. Um, and I would love to see a criminal justice uh, course for high school students, just like they have for, for other uh, vocational classes, such as welding and things like that. Get more students involved in criminal justice at an early age. So they, they feel that interest, whether it be forensics, whether it be law enforcement, corrections, things along that line, so they can get into the field at a young age because we are losing law enforcement officers. All right, very good. And so um, I'm going to move on to the next question here, Joe. We, um, and that is, um, you know, how do you see the role of the local business community uh, to facilitate, you know, and what do you see as the local business businesses playing a role in facilitating things like job expos, internships, apprenticeships, in-class institution. How can local businesses and how do you see or do you see local businesses playing a role working with the school district to implement any or all of those things? Well, uh, the one I just said was that the kids are right out of the vocational school, out of uh, the culinary arts, in fact, while they're in school. So they're learning and then they're working at the, the restaurant. Um, I saw a student from WTC last year electrical program is now working for uh, Citrus County School Board as an electrician in the electrician and also HVAC. So I think it's real important that we keep these, the young youth uh, local. That, that's my priority is let's try to keep them local. We lose so many of the students going to college and they don't return. So that's one of my goals is to help students stay local. Citrus County is a beautiful place. John, you know as well as I do where, where we grew up, it's, it's definitely a different time, but this is one of the prettiest areas in the world. And I've traveled and I've, I'm a diver, being a scuba diver, and I'm very fond of AES too and, and the work they're doing out there with our youth. But I just love Citrus County. I, I love going watching the manatee and, and, you know, going fishing or, you know, I go out on the airboat with my buddy to his island. It is just the neatest place. So it's, it's what, just, let's keep that secret though, too. All right. Okay. And so, so, you know, kind of taking that a step further, what role do you see the schools have in making students aware of career opportunities that exist locally? Well, I, I like the career fair. I, I like job fairs. I, I think that I remember going through a career fair when I was in high school and it got me interested in probation and parole. The law enforcement thing actually came when, when Phil Royal and Doug Alexander took going through the police academy. But, you know, I learned about being a probation officer from a career fair. And that's where my education went when I got out of high school with, you know, a degree in behavioral science and a minor in criminal justice, and then a specialty in probation and parole. So, I think that when you get a taste of it, because so often you see young men and women, and I have three nieces that all have college education and master's degrees, and none of them are doing what they went to college for. So I would love to see more that these youths find these careers that are local and stay local. Very good. Very good. So, so, uh, so Joe, tell us about your thoughts on uh, our school safety plans. Are they adequate? Um, and, and, if, and if they are, why? And why do you feel like they're adequate? And if they're not adequate, what are those improvement opportunities? Well, John, I'm, I'm actually not going to answer that question because, for one, I'm not going to share our school safety plans with the public. Okay. A lot of the information we use for, for safety and security, I don't believe should be public information. Very good. Um, so don't speak to the specifics. Do you, just kind of give me a flavor. Do you feel like they're adequate? Uh, and and maybe not the specifics of, of uh, what you would do, but how do you think your background would help influence what the school district could do? Well, being a school resource officer for the last almost 23 years, I believe it's been, and uh, having a master's degree in security management, I, I believe I'm an expert in the field. Um, so do I feel it's adequate? We, we implement what's called an ALICE uh, system um, Alice is a proven system that 
I find to be effective. Um, any more than that, I, I really don't want to share sure. of how we do, Alice. Sure, sure. Um, that, that makes I, sense, right? You know, it's it's years ago we used to use red and green folders, and so often I'd see teachers putting them by the door, and I'm like, take it away from that. That's not public information. You know, it's for the safety of, of our students, so let's keep it that way. Uh, two or three weeks ago, I went down to Dunedin, Florida, which I've never been there before, a beautiful area, um, and I was at a hometown type of school safety town hall meeting, and I drove down there on a Saturday, and uh, one of the speakers there was one of my childhood friends. Um, his name is Andrew Pollock. Andrew and I grew up together from first grade, second grade, all the way to college. I had dinner with him a month before the Parkland shooting where his daughter was shot nine times on the third floor. Um, I heard him speak about the brokenness of a school board system. And it, it made me look more into what Broward County was doing during Parkland and how some of the people that saw a young man walk into a school with a Remington rifle case from Cabela's. It was a Cabela's rifle case. And the man was too afraid to call the code red. Saw a young man walk in with a rifle case. And they actually got on the radio and say, and they called the boy crazy boy. And they said, crazy boys on campus never mentioned the rifle case or anything. And as I heard Andrew speak about his daughter being shot nine times and how the school board failed. Now, I'm not one to play Monday morning quarterback, but I'm hearing it firsthand. And I read his book on why Meadow died. And I, I say, thank God we live in Citrus County because we're on it. We're on it. We're aware of it. We're not afraid to call the code red. We're not afraid to hit our, our button there if we need administration. So, and we continuously train, you know, just Friday, I was at the range, no school contact, but they had us, you know, improving our skills. And I think that's very important. So as far as our school board goes, and as far as our school safety goes with the school resource officer, you, you know, in 2005, we were awarded, um, a national award as the best school resource officer unit in the United States. And I was part of that unit at the time. So that means a lot to me. And then we've also been awarded through the Florida Association School Resource Officer as an outstanding unit. So not that all those people that are still in the unit, but I was part of the unit there. And over the years, I, I've continued my training, you know? So on Hi. Saturday, I took my time to go down to a, a town hall meeting. We're going to uh, shift gears, Joe. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you so much. Um, what are your suggestions? What are your thoughts on addressing the issue that, that schools are having, and that is on attracting and retaining teachers, bus drivers, and, and other school personnel? And what should we, how should we be addressing the dynamic uh, issue changes within education? I would love to see is find out who's got it right. You know, it's like if somebody's starting a company, go visit a company that's doing those similar things. And because running a school board is like running a business and you have to find out what counties are doing it right. What counties have the least amount of uh, loss and has the greatest amount of retention of, of staff, bus drivers, uh, aides, school aides, maintenance workers, and find out what they're doing, you know, and, and learn from them. You know, and that's why even with the chamber, you know, how do we find out how to run a business? We talk to people in store. We go to people in the chamber, people that are doing these, people that are willing to assist us. I think it's a sim similar thing here that we have to find out who in the counties in the state of Florida or even throughout the United States, what are they doing to retain the best and the brightest? And how do we get the attention of the best and the brightest to come here to Citrus County? Because it's not always money. Uh, you know, I didn't come here for money. I came here because this is a beautiful area to live. And I think we could uh, recruit teachers based on where we live. We've got that ahead of a lot of other people, you know. So we've got a beautiful area, very, very low crime rate, you know. And hopefully we get some more affordable housing here that, you know, these teachers could come here. Okay. 
Okay. So, uh, so the last question I have for you, it's got uh, two parts to it. So, uh, uh, but they're tied together, of course. And that is, what's your position on the recent mandate changes from the governor and the legislator regarding curriculum? And then um, what do you think the best way is to help teachers navigate these new mandates? Well, what's your I thoughts think on, need... the, on the changes? And then how do you help teachers navigate it? I, I agree with the governor um, on a lot of parts with his, his mandates and and the bills that he's passed. Because our job is to keep kids safe. And if we're bringing in material that's not safe for kids reading at certain ages, um, and, and the bill did state age in there, um, I, I think that is very important that we follow the governor's request because a lot of research has gone into it. You know, if you think about it, we're, we've done something here that a lot of states aren't willing to do, you know? And our governor has taken a lot of heat for what he's posted or what he's trying to propose here. But parents are saying, keep my children safe. You know, the other day I was asked a question and it might've been from uh, a Chronicle about, do I feel that uh, book sales should be in the evening so parents can attend? And basically what I feel is that yes, they should be because as a school, you can't read every book that comes in from a vendor. They could give it a pretty cover, but you don't know what's in the inside of that book unless you read every single book. And it's the same thing with the restaurant. Vendors send the restaurant a lot of times food to taste, but you can't taste every dish on your menu every day before it goes out. So as books come in, you can't read that material before it goes out. So here is the opportunity for parents to attend book fairs, look at that material, see if it's suitable for your home and your beliefs, and then bring it home. Instead, they can't blame the school saying, well, you're bringing this group. You know, going back to the library issue, you know, and what was on the library, some people might have felt that was appropriate. Some people felt it wasn't appropriate. However, we can't please everybody, but our goal is to educate students, and let's educate students with math, science, social studies, English, vocation. Let's bring back home ec. Let's teach children how to write a check in a checkbook, you know, how, how to prepare a, and balance your checkbook, things along that line. And let's not worry about social issues. You might have to deal with social issues, but let's not teach social issues. Let's teach education. Very good. Well, Joe, thank you so much for your time today. And just to remind all of our viewers, right, you are on the November ballot. This is where it's going to be decided. You've made it through the yeah. primary. And uh, uh, given uh, the state's primary system, the top two vote getters are going to appear on the November ballot. So showing up is really important. Well, I'd like to thank the chamber for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, it, it's been a wonderful ride so far. And I love getting out and meeting people and, and sharing my thoughts and, you know, I've been working with children for 32 years, and this is just another way that I can continue to do that. So well, thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you to those that watch and continue to watch as we bring you uh, our oh, other videos as well. <laughs> thank you. Have a good thank night. You.